I have a green light. Am I on? All right. But it shouldn't be too difficult because all he asked me to do was uh, teach a chapter that's in this book. Now, let me tell you something funny. The first time I ever met Dr. Ruckman, I went over to his house. He was in the middle of Pensacola Christian College campus. That's where his house is. They built up this, their school all around his house. And they hated having him there. They had not German flags in the front yard, you know, statues, lions, you know, scripture verses hanging out of the shrubs. Oh, they hated it. When, they, when he finally sold them the house, they bulldozed it in 48 hours. <laughs> but uh, how could you make this stuff up? But the first time I came to see him, cold call, his ministry changed my life, turned me upside down about the King James Bible. But anyway, I, came, I went in there, he's in his sweatpants, walking around, and, his, and, he, and you know, he started taking his books of his, his own books off the bookshelf, talking about how God gave him so many wild things, you know, he's not smart enough to get that stuff. He said he'd open up the book and he'd stop and he'd say, now look at this, and he'd read something, he says, I don't even know what that means, where'd that come from? No clue. <laughs> That's the first thing I ever saw Dr. Ruckman say to me. Standing there in his blue, maybe his pajamas he was wearing, I don't know. And he said, I don't know, I don't know where that came from. I mean, the Lord's good like that. He'll give you insights to things, and then, you know, I don't know. So, preacher, if you want me to, I will turn to that chapter, and I'm going to look at it. What chapter did you say? Nine. Who? Nine. Nine, how to teach the Bible. No, how to study the Bible, right? Yes. First thing, oh, let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'll bless us. And a bunch of hungry birds here, Lord, that makes you happy because very few people care anymore. And we know that they're very sincerely interested in knowing more about your word. And uh, Lord, you must have given them a good, a good shot, a good view of you at conversion. I believe that's the theory, Lord. Moses said, show me thy glory. I believe you show us th different capacity. Now, we don't all get the same view, I think. I don't know. I've gone pretty crazy now. What, 46 years, Lord? I haven't turned back yet. And you must have done that with many of these good people here. So fill their cup now. Help them to get a better grasp on their Bibles. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Best thing you got going for you here is you have a good shepherd. And, he, and no doubt he married up. <laughs> like the black preachers. The women are doing that. The black preacher said he probably muchly up. And so you're blessed. And now uh, the Italians over here were saying how the preacher's over at his house every Monday, discipling them. That happened to me on Wednesdays when I was first saved. Every Wednesday, Ray Will came to our house after the Wednesday night service. And he came a little cup, a coffee and a piece of pie, and he just went over stuff. And I was like, I'd say you get it. Yeah. So I'm so glad to see that you have a shepherd that looks after you that way. Yeah. That's why he's doing something like this. Okay, so how to study the Bible. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, okay, well, uh, anyway, look at, listen. Do you think I need to make a commercial? Preacher, did I open the trunk of my car earlier and show you like seven, eight empty boxes in my car? That's stuff that's been shipped in since I've been here. I've sold so many books, I don't know what to do with it all. So I'm not hard up to sell books, but I am concerned for you. So if I were you, if you want to, if you haven't gotten this yet today, please you know, pay me and I'll put your name down. I'll order one to you. You'll have it in the mail Monday. This is my most popular book because it's my smallest book. It's only 300 pages. And uh, it's very informative. And it'll teach you a lot about the Bible. So for your sake, okay? So I'm looking at this now for the first time. And, and, and you know what's funny? I wrote that book, uh, Holy Ground, 18,000 hours. I mentioned that to you already. Six years, 10 hours a day. I wrote this in five and a half months. Preacher, right after a major split in the church that I was pastoring. When the devil hits you upside the head, God's ready to fill the vacuum and yes. come on in and don't ever worry about that stuff. That's when God will speak to you. It is good that I have been afflicted and I might learn thy statutes. Isn't that what David said? So, yes. the, don't get mad at me, but the Bible could be true. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Let me read some of this stuff to you. A pseudo King James only church. You know what a pseudo King James? You know, they say they are, but they're TR people. In my area, they don't really believe the King James English text is the final authority. It's a good translation, but the Greek is the final authority. 
A pseudo King James only church in my area posted a sermon on their website entitled How to Read the Bible. The pastor's three point outline was as follows Read the Bible prayerfully, read the Bible thoughtfully, and read the Bible obediently. Now, in the first place, most of us learn how to read in elementary school. Secondly, God's specific command is to study the Word of Truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. When I was a lost Roman Catholic, the clergy made sure that the laity never came into contact with the Bible. For example, this is my reminder to take my stinking pills. Shut up. Yes, I did. Got my water. Thank you for asking. You know, two Iowa farm boys were freaked out about the only Catholic church in their town. And the one said to the other, what do you think goes on in there? They said, I got an idea. Next Sunday at Mass, let's meet back here. I'll sneak in there. You keep an eye out for the cops. And I'll spy out the land and come out and tell you what happens. Well, they did that next Sunday. And the little Iowa farm boy, you know, bib overall, straw in his mouth. He crawls into the back door of the Catholic church to check it out. It comes back 40 minutes later. And his eyes are real big. And his friend says, what happened in there? He said, man, was it wow. He said, one half of the room was standing up and chanting, my father can beat you and Dom, he knows. And then the other, other hand, that's what he thought, see? Then the other side stood up and said, no, he can't. And then they went up again, my father can beat you and Dom, he knows. No, he can't. He said they did it a third time. And my father can beat you and Dom, he knows. No, he can't. He said, then it took six Irishmen to pick up the bets. You know, Catholics don't pass a uh, you know, plate. They have a basket on the pole, man. They ain't letting that out of their sight. All right. When I was a lost Catholic, the clergy made sure that the lady, and there's no such thing as clergy and lady in a Baptist church. Right. We're all brethren, right? Uh, made sure that the lady never came into contact with the Bible. Now, I'll tell you this, neighbor. Twelve years in Catholic school, I never saw a Catholic Bible one day in my life. I mean, the St. Joseph's Douay Rheims Catholic version. Not a day. Twelve years. Wow. Yeah. Joe, Joe Biden says, I graduated from the, large, the second largest Catholic high school in Delaware, Archmere Academy in Wilmington. I graduated from the largest Catholic high school in Delaware, Salesianum, right across town in Wilmington. It costs $30,000 a year to go to that school today. Wow. And uh, it's a high school. And uh, the only difference between my school and his school is we had more pedophile priests. Literally. Wow. Go look up Oblates of St. Francis de Sales, Wilmington, Delaware. Big pedophile bust. 23 priests busted. Wow. Uh, broke the Wilmington, Delaware Archdiocese. 70-something million dollars. Wow. I can show you the mug shots of the priests. Three of them were my teachers. Yeah. Herm Hermley, McDevitt, I forget the third one. Oh, man. <laughs> By the way, did I tell you my one connection to Joe Biden? Can you believe this? You know I know that cockro co cockroach is a crook? You know how I know he's a crook? How he stole the election? Because he stole the wife of my best customer. How do you like that? You want to hear something freaky? I made some stuff up today. I'll admit that. This is absolutely true. <laughs> this is absolutely true, man. In 1972, Joe Biden, Jill Biden, back then she was Jill, Steve, uh, Jill Stevenson, married to a guy named Bill Stevenson. They, they opened up a nightclub in Newark, Delaware. Stone Balloon. Look it up. Rolling Stone magazine voted it the number one college bar in the whole country. Right there on Main Street, Newark, where the University of Delaware was, is. Bruce Springsteen played there all the time, Ray Charles, the Almond Brothers, everybody and their grandmother. Two, two weeks before they opened up and the last touch, it, you know, carpenters walk around with the last finishing touches in that place. I'm sitting on a bar stool in there. I'm not even old enough to drink. At night, I'm 19 and I'm filling the paperwork out for their cash registers. I sold him the cash register system for that stinking nightclub. About a year later, Joe Biden is uh, fooling around with Jill Stevenson behind her, her husband's back. He just put a book out this year about Biden stealing his wife. So much for that, amen? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, for example, every pope's worst nightmare has been that some good Catholic would stumble upon an, an enlightening verse like Mark 6.3 where the ever-Virgin Mary's other children are named. Sadly, many Baptist pastors employ a similar quarantine of the scriptures, 
lest one of their uninformed parishioners discover something that flies in the face of fundamentalist tradition. I told these good folks from Italy, if you, for them to get saved later in life out of Catholicism in old school Italy is insane. To wind up in a right dividing King James only Baptist church, that's freak show stuff. Yeah. You must have done something right in your former life. <laughs> you could have wound up in a fundamentalist church. Um, but then these men, are, these men, these pastors of these fundamentalist churches are merely passing along that which they received in Bible college. Acts 4.20, Peter said, we cannot help but speak and teach the things we've heard. That's all they know. For instance, every ministerial student is told that Satan's head was bruised at Calvary. Yet Romans 16.20, yet Romans 16.20 we read, and the God of peace shall, shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. He gets his head bruised when the Lord comes back at the second advent. Two references for that here in the chapter. Psalm 68, 21, in the back of 313. Is this being recorded, Pastor, by any chance? All right, so you can get the, this all later, but you can just read the material yourself. Enshrined within the hallowed halls of militant fundamentalism is the sacrosanct cliche that Old Testament saints looked forward to the cross, while New Testament saints looked back to the cross. Yet what saith the Scripture? If people living hundreds of years before the time of Christ were saved by comprehending the identical gospel, which Paul received and established, Galatians 1.11, why does the Holy Spirit tell us in the clearest possible manner that the most informed disciples were totally clueless regarding a bodily resurrection? Mark 9, 9 through 10, and, and as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen, till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. And they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one with another what the rising from the dead should mean. That's the 12 apostles, right before it happens. The latest time I checked, the resurrection was a vital part of the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 4. Now here's a critical statement, I think. So how could some Gentile child in 150 B.C. be expected to understand what was hidden from Christ's own apostles less than a week before the crucifixion? Then he took unto him the twelve. This is one of the most important verses. And I know, preacher, you've hit the key ones. I, I can feel it in my blood here. Then he, this is, in, this is over in Luke 18. You got your Bible there? Look at Luke 18. Yeah, most of you have, seen, have heard this probably. But you, you're getting blessed in this church. They're falling out of the trees getting saved, walking in the front door. What must I do to be saved? Can I go to church here? I mean, this is really a weird thing. Don't, and I don't want to overdo this saying you, you're really blessed here. But you are blessed. Amen. Again, you are really blessed. I would and it, read my material if you think I kiss up the people. That doesn't happen. I just called Treber a wimp on the <laughs> Facebook. Did you see it? What a wimp! What a wimp! What he did, beg, putting a video out begging the governor, please let us come into our church. Our people are cold out in the parking lot. And I said the martyrs would roll over in their graves. Yeah. Boy, that raised the holy stink. I'm going to New York in June. I had 16 churches booked. I got 14 now. Amen, Brother Gary. <laughs> and I'm going to take a baby aspirin over. Yeah. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. By the, by the time you saved a long time, you don't get worried about rumors. Yeah. yeah, it's all right. Look at Luke 18, 31 through 34. Then, then he took on, unto him the twelve and said unto them concerning the Son of Man, he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles. I'm, I'm, I got dot, 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 so I'm probably killing you. My wife told me something the other day. It cracks me up so bad. I married so up. It's like, I can't even breathe up there. It's so high. And my, my wife said something to me one time, just recently. She said, you're killing me, Smalls. I had never heard that expression, never saw that in movie. But as soon as I heard that, I thought, that's got something to that. I, I felt it. I looked it up, saw that little goofy little movie. I'm like, are you killing me, Smalls? <laughs> I use that all the time. I put it all through Facebook. I'm not you know, I'm retorting them critics. I said, you're killing me, Smalls. No, I can't even repeat the main thing I was saying. I, don't, I hope it's not too bad of a thing. I, I don't think it's that bad, but I don't want to say it in front of you. But my wife, she's a killer. Look at verse 31. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. Just because it was written doesn't mean one bit that they understood it at the time that they come across it. 
For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. And they shall scourge him, and put him to what? Death. And the third day he shall what? Rise again. What do you think's in between his death and his resurrection? Well, his burial. Yep. There's the gospel. Mm. And look at verse 34, people. Yep. And they understood, what's the next word? Not None of these. Now, because they're, they're precursors to the Baptists, the Holy Spirit's got a, how many times, how many times a charm? Three times a charm? How come Italians can't count to ten? Because every time they get to two, they run into a tree. Say amen right there. Everything's in threes because it's a reflection of God, right? We're a, refle we're a body, soul, and spirit. We're a reflection of God the Father, God the Son, and Holy Ghost. Everything's threes, right? Yes, no, maybe. Past, present, future. Red light, yellow light, green light. Mother, father, child. Uh, Molary and curly. Amen. <laughs> every uh, every poem's got, uh, I mean, every sermon's got three points to the poem, the outline. Every joke's got three parts to a punchline. How you doing? How many times did I just tell you they chanted? Three times. Every joke's that way. We don't know why that's going on. Do you know uh one of the things in, in this uh, chapter, how to study the Bible, is numerology. The pastor's son was asking about that. Do you know every business in this town, every store, has got a sign on the front door? That crazy bathroom I just went into, yeah. just now, said on the door, er, the King James Bible is the Word of God. <laughs> every business in this town has a sign that says that. So what are you, crazy? No. It says social distancing what? Huh? How many feet? Six. six. How do they, why, why do they know that? Why do they put six feet? You think they know that six is the number for a man according to the book of Revelation 13 per seven? Do you think they, you know, and again, preacher, I get into a fundamental church because I go anywhere I get a check. I mean, I go anywhere I get invited. <laughs> uh, you know, a fundamental church, they're going... I get into a Bible believer's church, you know, I'm messing up because you've heard half this stuff. But just act impressed. Do you think that crap? Yeah, but again, you got new people blowing in here, right? So do you think that, you think these heathen businesses know that man was created on the sixth day? I don't know that. Do you think uh, they know that the sixth book of the Bible is the book of Joshua, the first book of the Bible that happens to be named after a man with six letters in the, the name? Say, that's a coincidence. Yeah, but it's cool, ain't it? <laughs> yeah. All right, you got your Bible there? Yes. Why don't you go to Romans 6. Preacher, I hope you didn't tell him this one. This is one of the coolest ones I know. You ever want to, <laughs> you, you ever want to talk to a teenager sometime, right? Try to get him impressed with, get him off Facebook for seven seconds. All right, so uh, Joshua is the sixth book of the Old Testament. Romans is the sixth book of the New Testament. All right, what chapter do you think we ought to go to? Six. All right, go to the sixth chapter. You're in the sixth book. You're in the sixth chapter. Now, we need a verse. Uh, Eleven. Uh, I needed somebody to say that. I was just going to tell you, somewhere between five and seven. Six. All right, you all ready? You're in, you're in the sixth book, sixth chapter, sixth verse. There's your six, 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 right? Now go read the verse and tell me what the sixth word is. Crucified. Tell me what the sixth word is. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six. Oh! <laughs> man. You say you say you say that's a coincidence, oh, brother. Romans six, six, verse six. Sixth word. In the sixth Romans word. Six, six. You say, preacher, that's a coincidence. Yeah, but it's cool, isn't it? Amen. <laughs> you see it? Okay. Some, some, you got a King James Bible? Because what? Yeah, yeah. Look what the NIV says. Uh, four. We know that our old self wow. is. They add a word and they change man to self. That's your NIV, wow. your non-inspired version. To wreck that beautiful type in English. Wow. You see that, neighbor? Now, I'm telling you, neighbor. Uh, help me out, neighbor. When you kick the bucket, where do you go? Six feet. You go six feet under. They don't know why they're telling you to stay six feet away from here, theoretically, so you don't go six feet down there. And that's why the unsaved world may not come into your church, but they're familiar with the expression, deep six. That means it's finished. They don't know why. The King James Bible runs the stinking world, amen? 
You couldn't make that up if you had to. Wow. All right, so that's under numerology, right? All right, blah, blah, blah. Uh, okay, so I understood none of those things. All right, da 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 Okay, now let me, uh, let me continue reading here, okay? Had, had those, had those uh, Jews, uh, the apostles, been anticipating a bodily resurrection, re they're looking forward to the cross? Yeah. yeah. That, uh, if they had been looking forward to a bodily resurrection, how are we to account for their reaction to the woman's initial report of the event? Luke 24, 11, And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. They didn't believe that Christ was rose from the dead. Well, how are they looking forward to the cross? You're full of baloney. For, uh, for, hey, listen to this and this and this. John 20, verse 9. These are cross references. Again, later if you get the tape or you read through the material in this book, you got it all there, but sometimes it's good to write things down. You remember that sometimes after you write it down. John 20, verse 9. For as yet they knew not the Scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. How many times you got to have the Holy Ghost tell you they didn't know diddly? But the fundamentalists know something that the Holy Ghost never told these people. Should any pseudo, when I say pseudo, I'm making fun of, these are people who say they're King James, but they just, I, I preached a sermon at Crown College. Did you ever see that sermon? Did you ever see that? Oh, have mercy. I preached a sermon at Crown College for Clarence Sexton. The title of my sermon was Seven Signs of Pseudo King James Onlyism. When it was over, he came up right behind me, put his arm around me, wouldn't let me leave the pulpit, did damage control for 10 minutes. Brother Grady, you got us into a battle that we did not want to get into. And then it never gave me a copy of that tape. Never got out from them. I'm at Houston, I'm at uh, this Crown College, big fundamental school, Clarence Sexton. I'm over, I'm sitting in Shady 8, well, listen to this. Again, you get an old person like me, I got, a, I got 50 thickened million sermons. I mean, stories. <laughs> Seriously, I'm sitting in Shady Acres Baptist Church, Houston, Texas, a year before last at a camp meeting, and some guy sitting next to me, he's a missionary to the Virgin Islands. Oh, Brother Grady, how you doing, blah, blah, blah. We got laughing about stuff. He said, you know, the first time I ever heard you preach, I was in Virgin Islands, and I'm on my computer, and boom, there's you preaching at Crown College. Seven signs of pseudo King James onlyism. How you can spot a fake King James guy. He said, I saw that sermon. It blew my mind. I'm watching it live at the Virgin Islands. As soon as you end it, I grabbed my cell phone and called one of my closest friends who goes to Crown College, who runs the PA system. I got him on the phone. I said, hey, Joe Blow, it's me, whatever his name is, you know. That was a wild sermon. I want to be the first customer to sign up for the, you know, copy. This guy's telling me the story and they're sitting there. He said, he said, my friend told me every, the people hadn't gotten out of the auditorium yet. I mean, the, the smoke is still <laughs> flying and the building's still shaking. <laughs> Sexton's still sitting up there on the platform with the, with the telephone up to the PA room. He said, I just got a call from Pastor Sexton. He said, don't let that tape out. Wow. Wow. But see, let me show you how cool the Holy Ghost is. I'm shaving that morning, Friday morning, getting ready to go over to the, that big college that preached this sermon. Holy Ghost speaks to me as clear as I'm talking to you. Uh, if you ever want to get a copy of what you're fixing to preach, you better have your internet guru guy that you use for your stuff to tape that live off the internet because it's going to be broadcast live because you ain't never, I don't think the Lord said ain't, you're, 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 you're never going to get a copy of that. I put the razor down, picked up my cell phone, called his guru, said, hey, can you tape that for me live? No, no problem. So that sermon ended, the pastor's up there. I was about King James Bible. Man, they were burned out, out of mad. And they never were going to give that tape out. Nobody knew I had my own bootleg copy there. <laughs> it showed up on the internet two weeks later. Everybody's lying about stuff I didn't say and what I said. Wow. Anyway, anyway, you can get it on the internet. It's crazy. You, you, you'll see me preaching right in the middle of the sermon. I, I, got, I, I, got that, I got that whole sermon in this book. You know, and it's now $30. Forget that $20. <laughs> 
This is thirty dollars. You got one left on the table. We'll bid on who I, who it gets. <laughs> But right in the middle, one of the seven things is the R word, Ruckman. You say you're King James and you wouldn't touch Ruckman with a 10-foot pole, something wrong with you. Yeah. And right in the middle of the sermon, preacher, I turned around like this, Pastor Sexton sitting up there, you know, and I said, Brother Sexton, <laughs> you remember the time you told me? <laughs> remember the time you told me <laughs> how you spotted Pe Cl uh, Peter Ruckman at the Knoxville airport, recognized him, his funky old briefcase, you know, with the word Ruckman on a briefcase? <laughs> I thought you could spot him. And you walked up to him and you told me you introduced yourself to him and shook his hand and thanked him for his stand on the King James Bible. His face turned the color of this wall here. Wow. When I said that, he was telling me that to make me happy. He wasn't about to broadcast that to all his fundamentalist friends. Anyway, this is war. I wish you didn't have to be involved with this stuff and most of you don't need to be in religious politics all year round. Right. We know that. But we're talking about a critical issue. Yes. And when you see the message I'm going to preach, Lord willing, that deals with this King James Bible issue next hour, you'll see it better. Um, okay. I said all that because of this word. Should any pseudo be interested? <laughs> the disciples on the road to Emmaus cleared the air concerning exactly what Old Testament saints were expecting. Okay. Luke 24, 21. The, the, two, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. That's what the Jews in the Old Testament were looking for. Precisely as Zacharias had declared, quote, that we should be saved from our enemies. Luke 24, 21. Got that? Only afterward are the disciples enlightened by their resurrected Messiah. These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. That's after, not before. This is just one little point. Looking forward to the cross, looking back to the cross. That's just one cliche. In other words, what, what you ought to be getting out of this right now is saying, oh my soul, I can't believe I'm in a Bible-believing church, not a fundamentalist church. Fundamentalist people aren't bad, wicked at all. I was, I was saved duh, in a fundamentalist church. The pastor that got the gospel to me was a Bob Jones University graduate that wouldn't know the King James issue if he saw it. But he loved God and he got, got me saved. And the preacher and I were talking about this earlier. We both went through the same process. We started out fundamentalist and then we found Dr. Ruckman, the promised land, the King James Bible, and kind of got a little ick, you know, irritated. That's it, putting it mildly, isn't it, preacher, about the fundamentalist now. Couldn't stand the thought of them now. And God had to tell us both back to the right middle position. And the thing, the thing that God showed me one day about that was that Peter, James, and John were the original Bible believers. Didn't God show them a lot more stuff than he showed the other nine? Yeah. The other nine were like the fundamentalists. Yeah. How are you going to knock Matthew? Did he give you the gospel of Matthew? Yeah. Hello. You know why I'm a soul winner today? Because of Jack Hiles. Not Peter Ruckman. Peter Ruckman believes in getting people saved. You understand? I mean, these men, are, they, they love the Lord. You don't ever get a bad attitude toward them. But wouldn't you like to get as much as you can get? Yeah. And guess what? Out of Peter, James, and John, John had his head on, on Jesus' breast. He knew stuff Peter and James didn't know. Yeah. That's, a, that's a Bible believer that's balanced, probably. <laughs> P Peter's a Ruckmanite. <laughs> get that phone, cut the guy's ear off. <laughs> Bless God. <laughs> John... <laughs> He's the disciple whom God, the, the Lord loved. Amen. Maybe the Lord likes a balanced Christian. Though. Get closer to God's heart if you're not crazy. Amen. Ruckman's the guy that said the brighter the light bulb, the more bugs it attracts. <laughs> now here, here, here's, here's something cool. Turn to 1 Corinthians 2. This is as cool as it gets. I have a whole sermon based on this verse. As a matter of fact, one of the oldest sermons I have ever preached. 30, 40 years I'm preaching a sermon. Right? Why, God, why Christians suffer? Kind of like the message this morning as far as you know, results or goals, effects, what you're trying to accomplish. But it, uh, watch this now. This is as good as it gets. Uh, uh, then he opened, remember the last thing we read in Luke 24, then he opened their understanding, right? This is what the Holy Ghost is talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8. Look at the verse. Which none of the princes of this world knew, 
For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Hello. Remember what the Jews said with the verses we just quoted, Zacharias and, and, the, and, the, and the disciples on the road to Emmaus? What did they say? We were hoping that he would deliver us from our enemies. That's what, they, that's what they understood the Messiah to be. Why do you think Peter's got a sword? We're going to start a revolution against the Romans, like Barabbas thought. Uh, guess what? That's what Satan thought. Why do you think he put Jesus on the cross? Because they didn't want him to be the king of Israel. Hello? But if, the, but if, in other words, not only did the Old Testament saints not know what Jesus was dying for, to, to redeem the world, make it possible, neither did Satan. What does that say there? Which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Why would Satan and his imps, his princes of this world, be pushing Jesus to the cross if that was going to make salvation available to the world. One of the coolest sermon titles I ever heard of was some old preacher one time, Pastor. must have been 69 years old in November. <laughs> That's for, that glare is meant to hold your attention here. <laughs> Do you know what he, uh, the title of his sermon, not me though, this older guy, you know what his sermon title was? The greatest secret that was ever kept became the greatest story ever told. Who did you mention today at, at, outside under the tent there? Uh, that actor. He, uh, he, uh, he was the guy that played in the greatest story ever told. He, uh, yes, Max von Cito. I was, I mean, that's the stuff. Remember when lost Catholics in New York growing up? You know, the Ten Commandments. Whoa, that's as close you got to the Bible. Moses, my man Moses, Charlton Heston, and, and, and uh, Mahalia Jackson, black singer, Baptist. He got the whole world. Salvation Army bell ringers. That's a Protestant. I can remember hearing people say that. Protestants. That's the only connection we have with non-Catholic stuff in that locked up world in the Catholic system. But uh, the greatest story ever told, and then the other movie was King of Kings. Two movies came out at the same time. The greatest story. I got chick tracks in my uh, vehicle right out in the doorway panel right now. The greatest story ever told. You've seen it. The, bat, the preacher said, the greatest story ever kept became the greatest story ever told. First, it was a secret. And even Satan got scammed. And he's stupid fundamentalist. And I mean that. When you show them the scriptures, they still don't accept it. Well, tradition. Anybody remember, uh, uh, what's his name? Fiddler on the Roof? Tradition. Tradition. Blah, blah, blah. How many of you know what they call the, the uh, section of I-95 between New York and Miami? It's the Jewish Passover. Hey, remember the <laughs> All right. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. But there is more. Not only was the particular redemptive mission of, of Israel's Messiah hid from Old Testament Jews, but the name of their prince as well. While the nation was informed of their God's personal name in Exodus 3.14, and while Psalm 2 verse 12 reveals that he has a son, now maybe some of this, you may have a hard time following everything because I'm reading it to you, right? You need to buy the book. Uh, blah, 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 joke. Okay. Um, and while Psalm 2.12 reveals that he has a son, the name of that son was presented as a mystery of sorts. Proverbs chapter 30 verse 4 asking what is his son's name if thou canst tell see God has a son it's a good verse to show a Jew when Manoah met the angel of the Lord an Old Testament appearance of Jesus himself he asked him directly what is thy name whereupon the son of God you know Old Testament appearances of Christ are all over the place and uh, anytime you see the angel of the Lord, it's Jesus. The Son of God replied, Why ask, askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is a secret? Judges 13, 17 through 18. Thus, in retrospect, verses such as John 8, 5, 6, you know something, I've got so much cool stuff here, uh, but I, that may eat up too much of the clock. Wait a minute. Yeah. 
some of this might bog you down a little bit. So let me get up to um, the main points of this chapter, how to study the Bible. Preacher, that might be more beneficial for time, because I've got about six or seven, eight steps to how to study your Bible better, right? Yes. These pages I've been reading are introduction. There's two more pages of it, but it's so heavy I may get bogged down and not understand what I, what I wrote. So I'm going to just jump right now to the main points, okay? The first one is the law of first mention. Again, your pastor has taught you a lot of this stuff already. The, the law of first mention. The law of first mention teaches that the primary meaning of any word or phrase in the Bible is generally revealed by the way it is used the first time it appears in Scripture. While subsequent usage may add further clarification, the original mention will always set the tone for the basic understanding of the word throughout the rest of the Bible. All right, a sample of such occurrences would include the following. All right, let me show you a couple good ones. So turn to Genesis 13, verse 13. Because uh, 13 is the number for rebellion. We know that, right? Genesis 13. This is more cool stuff to show young people. Okay? All right. And we can kill two birds with one stone here with numerology. Did we say six is the number for a man already? Yes. You know, 13 might be the number for rebellion. What do you think? All right, uh, all right, let's go to something else and then we'll jump over to here. Go to Genesis 1. Some preacher in, North, in Tennessee showed me this. This is not in anybody's numerology book. This preacher running a big church, pastor, about 14 people in his church. James Melton, Sharon, Tennessee. And I said, the Lord show you anything lately, Jim? You know, unusual in the Bible? He said, well, as a matter of fact, and this is what he showed me. Look at verse 1. Who wrote the Bible, by the way? Anybody know? God. God, okay. So verse 1, in the beginning what? God. All right. Created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2, and the earth was without form, and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the spirit of what? God. God moved upon the face of the waters. Verse 3, and God said, let there be light. Verse 4, and God saw the light. That's uh, Hank Williams' life's verse. Amen right there. And God saw the light. All right, verse 5, and God called the light. Verse 6, and God said. Verse 7, and God made. Verse 8, and God called. You get any idea? Verse 9, and God said. Verse 10, and God called. Verse 11, and God said. Verse 12, and the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after its kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself. Uh, after its kind and what? God. Hey, have you noticed anything? God. He's in every verse. The Bible's just beginning. Don't fall out of the pew and hit your head. What's the next verse say? Help me, Rhonda. How much pizza did you eat out there? What's the next verse say? Evening in the morning with the third day. Hello, neighbor. Look at verse 14. I'm back. I'm back. First time God disappears out of your Bible. It's the first time the number 13 ever shows up. Wow. Have not I chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil? Whoa. How many people in the room when Jesus made that statement? 13. 13. <laughs> well, who was number 13? Jesus? I wouldn't think so. There's not 13 letters in his name. Like Judas Iscariot. So we know 13 is the number for sin and rebellion in Scripture. You know, I saw that same preacher the next year. I said, Jim, the Lord show you anything unusual again? He said, well... As a matter of fact, he looked up the, in the New Testament, look up the word one, O-N-E, spelled out in English numbers, letters, right? O-N-E. He said it was 607 times in the New Testament, word one. Then he looked at two, it was 139. Looked up T-H-R-E-E, -E, 75, 4, 54, 5, 45, 6, 14, 7, 91, 8, 6, 9, 5 times, 10, 31 times. 11, 6 times, 12, 75 times. The number 13, T-H-I-R-T-E-E-N, New Testament. Take a guess how many times it shows up. 14, 5, and on. 13 is a spooky number, ain't it? 
13th. Yellow. It's like when I was a little kid in New York delivering the New York Times, 1967, 68 on Sundays. The paper was like a phone book, New York Times, Sunday edition. I had to take them out on hand trucks. I'd go into the big apartment buildings. You know, every one of those freak show elevators jumped from the 12th floor to the 14th floors. They didn't have any 13th floor. Unsafe people don't like that number. So go back to Genesis 13. Well, look at Genesis 12. Blah, blah, blah. All right? What's it say there? Uh, Genesis 14. So what's it say over here in verse 4? Genesis 14, 4. Twelve years they served Shedel Abner, right? And what's it say? Thirteenth year they rebelled. That's the first time the word 13th with a T-H on it shows up in the Bible. And it's telling you it's connected to what? Rebellion. Duh. All right, go over to uh, Genesis... Uh, yeah, go over to Genesis 17, verse 25. Here's the first time the, the word, the number 13 by itself, without the TH on it, is found. Pastor, I can't believe your PA guy is actually watching me instead of being on Facebook. <laughs> In the old days, they sat up there and played solitaire. Now they're on Facebook. He's watching me. Amen. Who's next to him? I see a head moving there. A little... Oh, cool. All right. Trainee, amen. Yep. And Ishmael, his son, was what? 13. 13 years old when he was circumcised. So the first time the word 13 shows up, it's talking about who? Ishmael. Ishmael. What kind of dude was he? Look at chapter 16, verse 12. Talking about Ishmael. And he will be a what? Wow. Thank you. Crazy. Those two ISIS fathers. One's visiting the other one's home. Fallujah, right? You know, you got pictures up on the wall of our kids, what they do the same thing. Here's one ISIS father talking to another one, looking at the pictures. How they blow up so quickly. Uh, I didn't say that. He said it. They're wild. They're crazy. I got a story in my Israel book. This plane was landing. A British, uh, an Egyptian pilot or a British pilot was coming in somewhere in Palestine or somewhere in the Arab countries. I got the story. And the, the, the Muslims are so crazy excited, jump around. They're shooting their guns up into the sky crazy. That plane lands, that pilot's bleeding to death. Oh, man. They shot him right out of the sky accidentally. <laughs> it's one of their guys. That got it in the book. Oh, <laughs> All right. Uh, 13 is a rebellion number. Now, we're talking about the law first mentioned, right? So go back to Genesis 13. You got two of these things going on at one time. One of these seven main points in this chapter is numerology. I'm on the law of first mention now, but I'm merging it with numerology because so many of these examples are beautiful. And they're perfect. Okay, ready, neighbor? You're in Genesis 13, right? Mm -hmm. That's the first cha 13th chapter of the Bible. Okay? All right. Take another wild guess now. Ready? What verse do you think we'll all look at? 13. All right, go to verse 13. Now, ready, neighbor? When you read that verse, why don't you read the verse and count how many words are in the verse? These are these English co coinky dinkies. Thirteen. What about that, neighbor? <laughs> Somebody said a coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. Oh, See it? Amen. Now, look at that verse. Now, the, the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners. What's the next word? Before. What? Before. Sinners before the Lord. Oh, yes. Sinners... Before the Lord, exceedingly. You, you should have known that's not what I wanted. <laughs> Jeez and crackers. Don't you know what I'm thinking? <laughs> and sinners before the Lord, what kind of sinners were they? Exceedingly. You all know what kind of sin they were doing down there? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Bad stuff, neighbor. Yeah. You see that word sinner? That's the first time in the King James Bible that word shows up. Yep. Connected with what number? Thirteen. All right, neighbor. I'm telling you, neighbor. Now, by the way, all sin isn't, all, all rebellion isn't bad. Aren't you people rebelling against the system right now for God? Uh, I got a cross reference somewhere. Blah, blah, blah. Kings. Somewhere in Kings. First Kings, I think. Hang in there, neighbor. 
Um, blah, blah, blah. Ah, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. 2 Kings 18.7. I'll just tell you what it says. Hezekiah rebelled against the king or King Sennacherib. And, 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 he, and, he, and all God is doing is bragging on it. Nobody like Hezekiah. He re, for he rebelled against the king. And that was a picture of the Antichrist, the Sennacherib dude, right? Yeah, so, uh, so can you get good rebellion? Yes or no? Sure. Uh, you know, all right, go to Acts 13. <laughs> 13. You know what you're going to find in Acts 13? The greatest rebel of the church age goes into the Lord's work here. And how many ever heard of Saul of Tarsus? Amen. Yeah. You know how you know he's a rebel? He wrote 13 books that begin with the word Paul. 13 books. Nobody knows who wrote Hebrews. I don't know if the Lord knows who wrote Hebrews. Amen. <laughs> But uh, John, Jack Hiles used to say, if John, he said if Barnabas didn't write it, or Paul, John R. Rice probably wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, look at Acts, look at Acts um, I mean, 13, and uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. This is one of my favorite ones. Uh, the Lord showed me this. I didn't read this in any book. There's so much cool stuff out there. You can read your Bible, and the Lord will show you wonderful things. Amen. Now, there was in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Mahanaim. Look at here, which had been brought up with Herod. That's one of his stepsons got saved. Boy, don't you know, the day of Caesar's household salute thee. Paul got all over the place. And they ministered unto the, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas, and who? Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. So here's, look at this now. This verse gives you two things. One, the position. Saul's in second position, right? Barnabas is the trainer. And Saul's the trainee, right? And Saul has his uh, Hebrew name. He doesn't have his Roman name yet for the Gentiles he's going to go after. Look down at chapter, uh, same chapter. Look at... Uh, Look at verse 46. When, or verse 43. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and the religious proselytes followed Paul. And what? Barnabas. When you get to the end of the chapter, and it's repeated in verse 46, Barnabas and Saul have, has changed to Paul and Barnabas. Mm -hmm. Paul's top banana now, and he's got his Roman name. See it? Good night. When do you think that happened? Let me ask you a question. What chapter are we in? I said, great rebel of the church age. Say it. I wonder when he takes charge. I wonder where he takes over. Take a wild guess. Oh, I never know. You never can tell. <laughs> now when Paul, how about that? And what? His, His company, company lose from Paphos. They came to Perge and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Acts 13 is when Paul goes into the Lord's work, and verse 13 is when he's commissioned to be the top enchilada. Acts 13, verse 13. He's the great rebel of the church age. One of the great truths to teach your teenagers for, the, for them to rebel against the system. Yeah. Ruckman used to talk about a missionary from Japan. I'd never heard his name. I've been there twice, one of the sickest, deadest places to try to serve God. You can be there a lifetime and run about five people in your church. But anyway, this old Japanese missionary, Ruckman said, used to say, the, the duty of every Christian in any age is to discern the spirit of the age. And then they go diametrically opposed to it. All right, neighbor. All right, we might as well look at one more. Let's go to the book of Hebrews. Ladies, on a, uh, what chapter? 13. All right, go to Hebrews 13. You know, ladies, on a cold morning, when your deadbeat husband gives you an elbow in the morning and says, get up and make the coffee, you know what you tell them to do, don't you? Tell them to read the book of Hebrews. Amen. <laughs> but preacher, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lodge a formal protest right now. That coffee changed my life. It was good. You got the worst cream in the history of America. <laughs> I, I promise. I put two of those little, two, in a cup that big. It was as dark as that piano over there. Was it? What is that stuff? 
Oh, somebody got offended. Look, there's the cream lady. <laughs> you know, I don't know, what is that? You know, you don't want to know something? I got mad. I was driving up to preach at Pacific Baptist College. Uh, it, it, was, it was bad. Thanks for telling me it now after I drank it. Thur Thursday, I'm going to preach at Pacific Baptist College in the morning, racing over there to teach, you know? And, uh, I, and I, my, my little funky little can of hairspray that I'm got to take on a plane, it was dead. It died that morning, and my hair is so light, loose. If I don't put hairspray, I'm dead. And I'm hurting, wondering what to do, and I'm racing over there. Here's a little nasty little gas station. I got out, you know, you want the room with electricity, you know, kind of guy in there, you know, Godhead Ministry, and I went in there, and I got this, how much does this thing cost? You know, $50, you know, <laughs> you know, I don't know what it was, it was exorbitant, but I was hurting, so I paid it, walked out, cussing the day of my birth, I don't want to get ripped, it might have been 4 or $5, a can of hash brown. and I got to my car, took the lid off, and shot it, you know, um, that guy bought that. It was a shipwreck somewhere, and the cargo got on. You know, just some underground junk he bought. I got so mad. So what I did was I, I said, I'll get this cockroach. I'm going to go back and show it to him and demand my money back after I shot myself. And, and I was starting back. Don't look at me like that. I, preachers, we're sinners too. We're just not as messed up as you are. We're messed up, but we're not as messed up as you, or we'd be out of a job. I started going back to that little grease ball place, and the Holy Spirit said, hey, dummy, you're going to need hairspray the next three or four days. Just deal with it, okay? It's, you know, oh, all right, forget you. Uh, what that has to do with anything I'm at now, I don't have any clue. All right, Hebrews 13. Well, what verse? 13. Okay. This is for the tribulation saints, primarily, but it'll apply to any good church age Christian application. Uh, hello, neighbor. Why don't you read that verse and when you're reading it, count how many words in that verse? 13. Whoa. Now that's rebels in the church in the tribulation period. Yeah. If you don't take that mark, yeah. you resist. You're going to take a mask now, you're going to take a mark then. And you'll take a vaccine in between. Amen. I'm telling you, neighbor, we're getting close to the end. Okay. Preacher, we're doing okay. F what is it? It runs from 4.30? 4 to 5.30. It's a 5.30. 4 to 5.30. All right, neighbor. Man, unless you need a break. Do I look like I need a break? What did I tell you? Am I an animal? Now, preacher, wait a minute. You're the shepherd. If these poor, you know... 30, 20, 30 year old people can't keep up with me right now, and they're burning out? Oh, I think they'll be all right. I think I'll be the answer. If you need to use the potty. Let's do that. Let's take five minutes. All right. Let them use the restroom. Okay. And then, and then uh, now how much you want to bet me? Let's start there. Let me use the bathroom. Keep now, now people are scared. They don't, <laughs> that poor lady needs to go. You're not going to hurt me. Oh, these people are so sincere acting. Amen. <laughs> we'll do this. We're going to take five. We're going to take five. All right? That's a shepherd right there. I told you he's looking after you. Use the restroom. Use the restroom. Thank you for good. Five. Take five. I can, only go, I can always go five minutes longer. Yes, sir. That's right. That's right. All right. What a good shepherd you got. Look, look, one person needs to go to the bathroom. Fifty people are leaving. <laughs> Ready to go after again? Yeah. Yeah. Sir. All right. Adam? Yeah. Where's Adam? Right here. Adam, pray for us. Yes, sir. Lord, to give me a short one. No, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't write you what he said. Uh, Lord, and Father, it was good to be saved. Father, the real blessing heaven. Uh, Dr. Grady here. Lord, I'm always so blessed to hear the preaching, Lord. And Father, heaven, is that you give us strength, you give us grace. We'll call the Holy Spirit as we uh, glorify your name, Lord. Okay, man. Uh, one more first mention. I have about 20 of them in the in this section in this book, the illustration. But my one of my favorites, you got a face only a mother can love. Anybody ever remember that quote? Yeah. Okay. When you think of love, you think of a mother's love. My son never did it, right? John Wayne Gacy's mother was in the death chamber. He buried 33 boys under a building. 
She, he didn't do it. You know, mothers. But you know, when you think of uh, a mother, a uh, love, you know the law of first mention, right? Yeah. You know what? It's uh, Genesis 22, 2. Yep. It's a father's love. Right. Take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest. Love father's love is, unra is, is, is uh, unrated, low rated. But it's very serious, okay? Kabish? Just thought I'd throw that out to you. Amen. All right, other uh, topics here. I have similitudes. Uh, in Hosea 12.10, the Lord said, I have also spoken by the prophets, and I have multiplied visions and used similitudes. Uh, the use of similitudes is one of the most basic methods of Bible instruction employed by the author himself. Uh, it's like a, a, a likeness or resemblance. The Lord says, you can't understand this, but you can understand this. And he'll give you something that you can understand to help you understand a spiritual truth. All uh, right, I'm not going to go into that. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Okay, you want to know what determination is? All right, so much for that. There's about 10 of these paragraphs, and there's no way to cover all of them. So I'm going to isolate the most important ones in just a moment. Next one I have here is um, a Webster's 1828 Dictionary. I went through five years of Bible college as a student in the school I eventually went to teach in, right? It's five years. You know, cash in tuition payments, right? Never heard the word similitude. Never heard anything about a Webster's 1820 dictionary. Nothing. Fundamental school. Hey, this now also that in the last days perilous times shall come, right? Quoted it this morning. What's Webster say for perilous, dangerous, hazardous, full of great risk? Webster's is an inspired book, but it's the best dictionary if you want to look up what those English words meant when they were put into the, your Bible by those men that God allowed to use to give us the greatest book that ever changed the history of this world to the degree it's been changed. Very important dictionary. Use that and when you look up your English words. I use it all the time, right? All right, typology. Bible types are first cousins to similitudes. The main difference between the two is that typology is primarily prophetic in nature. Occasioned by the aforementioned, ah, bah, 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 bah. as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so much the Son of Man be lifted up. Right. He says, you want to know what happened to me on the cross? Look at that serpent on that pole. It's on every ambulance mm -hmm. that goes by. You can see it. And something happened when the lights went off. So terrible, God didn't even want the angels to see what happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've got my own theories about it, and I line up with what Brother Ruckman thought. That doesn't make it gospel, but... Uh, he said, I'm a worm and no man. And he'll get that teaching from him. You won't get that in 99 fundamentalist churches out of 100, if not a, you won't get it in one church. No time to get into all that, but pictures. Here's a great picture. We were talking about this at the table out there. You got, uh, everything comes in threes, yes? You got Egypt, you got the wilderness, and you got Canaan land, right? Lost man, newly saved man, possibly carnal, spiritual man. You come through the Red Sea to leave Egypt. That's a picture of salvation. What, what color was the sea? Red. Yeah, I think you went through the blood, didn't you? Yeah. Amen. And you couldn't save yourself. That's right. The water had to be parted for you. Amen. And when you came through, it closed behind you. Yes. That's eternal security. You can't get back Amen. if you wanted to. Amen. And then you land in the wilderness. It's where the Jews landed. See, a type. Now, what happened? They never went anywhere fast. They, 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 wound up, they wound up wandering for 40 years. So that's the, the wilderness is a picture of the carnal man. Natural man, uh, that's a term for lost people. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Natural man, then saved people are divided into two. All lost people in one group, natural. If you're saved, you can be in two groups. You can be in the carnal group that stays in the wilderness and never grows. But if, you, if you're faithful like Joshua and Caleb, two out of a millions, they, they were spiritual. They cross into the promised land later. They cross the, over the Jordan. Jordan's got a part for them. You part the Red Sea, that's a picture of salvation. When you go through the Jordan, that's a, all the hymn writers call death crossing Chile Jordan in a type. But that's really a picture of the victorious Christian life. When you really sell out to God, you know there's giants in there. You can't make that decision until you know what the cost is going to be. Yeah. Then you go in anyway. I'm willing to fight for God. Well, man, you're going to have a... It's going to get on then. That's a, that's a type. 
if you read the life of Joseph, for instance, 40 chapters in Genesis, there are 160 things that happened to him that happened to Jesus. What are you going to do with that? Major type in the Bible of Christ. All right, that's on the typology. Again, I'm just hitting the high points. Bible names are very important. Uh, I, whenever I preach a sermon, I look up a person's name, uh, the Bible character, and, and I get so many beautiful pictures of uh, the Bible truths about um, what that word means. Paul means little. The first lesson God gives you in the Pauline epistles, uh, 13 books begin with the word Paul. God uses little people. What was his name in the Old Testament? Saul. Same thing, means little. What did God tell Paul's uh, prototype, Saul? When thou was little in thine own eyes, I used you. But you thought you got carried away with how important you are. Don't ever get impressed with yourself. But you look at the names and what the names mean. Blah, blah, blah. I, I used to tell people, you know, Christian family, you name all your kids Bible names usually. And I got saved that at due season. I got mad. I told, I told my daughter one time, Sarah, I said, you know, the closest you got to Bill in the Bible is I'm between Baal and Bildad. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, blah, blah, blah. All right, numerology. We talked about that already, didn't we? Isn't that beautiful? Nine is the number for fruit bearing. Nine fruit of the Spirit. Uh, Abraham's 99 when he's going to have that miracle baby born in late season. Sarah was 90. There's three nines in there. Help me, ladies. How many months you carry, Junior? All right, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's, all the numbers are significant. Okay, nine is fruit bearing number. Um, blah, blah, blah. I'm skipping the threefold application. I already told you that thing's coming threes, right? Blah, blah, blah. Whole section about threes. Man, I've got tons of threes. Ain't that something? Thrice was I beaten with written Paris, Prince Paris and Blanket. <laughs> and Michael Jackson's three kids. Three bears or three little pigs. Three stooges. CBS, ABC, NBC. I got zillions of these. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Amen, Brother Grady. Three coins in the fountain. <laughs> All right. Zillions of threes. All right, here's, here's a very important one, real important one. Cross-referencing. Cross-referencing. Corinthians talks about comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. You ever read that verse? Key verse, blah, blah, blah. Um, where is that verse, Pastor? Isn't it? It's in 1 Corinthians, I'm pretty sure, isn't it? Comparing spiritual things with spiritual things? Yeah, it's in chapter 2. Yeah, two, it's chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. All right, let me show you a cool... You want to see something really cool? I'll show you a couple of them here. Look at Genesis. Genesis 2. This is as cool as it gets. Genesis 2. Um, as soon as that, uh, as soon as that woman messes up, um, uh, okay, the devil gets judged by uh, the serpent gets judged in Genesis 2, right? Um, verse, uh, yeah, verse 14. The Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and, and uh, above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go. In other words, a serpent was floating in midair or walking on his tail. He wasn't slithering on the ground when he talked to Eve and Adam, right? Uh, and and, and, and on, on Joe Biden, upon thy belly shalt thou go, right? And what's the next? And what's the next word? Verse fourteen. And what? And dust. dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. See that? Yeah. Now you don't go fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen verses. Pardon me, five verses to verse nineteen. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken, for what's next word say? Dust. dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. What do you read over there in verse um, uh, 14? You see it? What's Satan going to be eating? 
Yeah. What's five verses later? God called men. Thank you very much, ladies. What's that top vacuum cleaner several years ago? Dirt devil? Yeah, thank you very much. Elvis has left the building. That's cross-referencing. Going from, see, fundamentalists, the closest they get, and I'm not trying to mock them now either. I'm trying to let you see how good, what does the Bible say? What dost thou have that thou didst not receive? Yeah. Are you special because you're no. a King James guy? God had grace on you. Yes, thank the Lord. What a deal. I alone have escaped to tell thee. That's my favorite verse in Job. I escaped Catholicism. I escaped New York City. I escaped uh, fundamentalism. Yeah. I escaped the nuttiest of the Ruckmanites. I mean, I'm, I, I, I know sane ones. <laughs> I'm still alive. I hit him with five shots and he's still alive. Godfather. I got too many pictures in my head. Uh, and voices are in there. The pictures are in there. That's a good Italian. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. You all see that? Okay. Now let me show you another one that's wilder than that. Uh, turn to... Um, uh, Yeah, Psalm 23. So Joseph is the number one type of Christ in the Bible, and David is right behind Joseph, like a number two. Okay? I got a real good one here. See, some of this stuff I haven't taught for a long time, and now I'm, uh, yeah, here it is. All right, look at... Uh, All right, Psalm 23. I just read the most beautiful thing on Facebook the other day, preacher, about he anointed my head with oil. And it talked about how a shepherd pours, pours oil on a sheep's head because all these bugs get in his nose and hatch eggs in there and bugs beep, little bugs bite the sheep to pieces and a sheep can beat his head against the post and kill himself trying to get those. And the shepherd puts oil on that head to cleanses the head and keeps the, oil, the bugs away. Your mind is susceptible to a lot of garbage, isn't it? Yeah. He wants to put that beautiful oil over your head. Oh, yeah. oh that just tore me up. And I'm an animal lover big time. And I read that and blew my mind just a couple of days ago. Beautiful. Uh, remind me, I'll, I'll show it to you on the phone and get it to you. All right, Psalm 23, blah, blah, blah. Look it over here. And the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down and what? Green pastures. You all see that? Yes. All right. He's a picture of Christ, isn't he? Remember what I said this morning in Matthew 16, Jesus balls the Pharisees out. They can discern the signs of the weather, but they can't read the prophetic signs. All right. Here's one of those prophetic signs they missed. You see this verse he just looked at? Jump over there to Mark 6 real fast. This is cross-referencing. Oh, I know what I was starting to say when you're turning. This is very important. The fundamentalists that we don't hate, right? But when they, when they, have, when they believe in cross-referencing, you know what they do? It, they use a Schofield Bible and they, 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 they utilize chain references, mm -hmm. which is a good thing to do. Yeah. How you doing? She's so spiritual looking. <laughs> uh, and how old are you? Okay, I'm trying to think of what boys I know for you and what girls I know for you. <laughs> nothing personal, nothing personal. <laughs> Um, 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 okay, so they, they use chain references, for instance. All right, for instance, by John, I did this, coming up. John 3.3, 3, you must be born again, right? Right next to that, I write John 14.6. So, so I'm reading my, my verse, and I see that. That takes me to the next verse that says the same thing. You have to be saved. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. All right. Next to John 14, 6, I have Acts 4, 12 written down. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. See all three verses teach the same thing? Yeah. You know, the verses about works. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, Titus 3, 5, 1 Timothy 1, 9. You see it? Galatians 2, 16, they all say the same thing. Works won't save. That's fundamentalist cross-referencing. That's okay. It's helpful. But Bible believers... Cross-referencing, it's words. Yes. You connect the verse with the word and bow, have it pop up over here. And there's an explosion on the paper. Yeah. And God gets the glory. Yes. Four-pointed handkerchief on the preacher. He gets the glory on some of the other stuff. 
I don't want, I, I'm, I'm now, now I'm thinking of North Carolina down there, they say, I don't want to be ugly. I'm starting to get ugly. Okay, again, what dost thou have that thou dost not receive? All right, where are you at? Mark 6? What's it, what's it say down here in verse 34? And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were as what? Sheep, Sheep not having a what? Shepherd. Shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Am I right, neighbor? They're in a desert place. Hello, neighbor. Look at verse 39. He commanded them to make all, what's the next thing? Yeah. By where? By companies where? He made them lie down in green pastures. And they don't see it. Luke says, they knew not the time of their visitation. Now we're cross-referencing here. We're taking one word, green. See it? All right, now hang a left. Go to Song of Solomon real quick. Song of Solomon chapter 1. What's that say in Romans chapter um, 11 about the Jew? They're, they're, current, they're, they're enemies of the gospel for your sakes. Aren't you glad the Jews messed up? You, would never, you never would have even been born. Okay? So because they messed up, guess what happens to us? Hallelujah. We get in. Amen. Song of Solomon's a picture of the church and Jesus, the groom and, and the woman, right? The bride and, 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 the, and the groom. Now here's the bride talking. Song of Solomon 1, verse 16. Behold, thou art fair, my beloved, yea, pleasant. What's the next thing say? Our bed is what? Green. Thank you very much. Elvis has left the building. <laughs> what is green for? Green's for fruit bearing. It's life. You know why the Lord and the church gets married? So they can have babies. Turn to Romans 7 real quick. Romans 7. Blah, blah, blah. Romans 7. Picture of you when you got saved. You got... You died to your, your old flesh and you got reattached to another. It's just like Adam and Eve, one flesh, yes? Verse 4, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fr what? Yes, yeah, your babies, your spiritual babies. Your bed is what color? Green. All right. Jack Scott, brother, he had some sick sermons about this stuff, didn't he? Uh, he had sick ways of putting it. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a sweet way to put it, okay? I, heard some, I was with some North Carolina preacher one time, real big dude, I forget his name. He pastors in Lenore, North Carolina. Big old redneck North Carolina preacher. And man, look, they got more power with the Holy Ghost down there than you ever saw anywhere in America. They don't know the doctrine very right, but boy, do they got the Holy Ghost in there. Just like you come into the tabernacle preacher, look. You come in from the east, the north, that's where the, the bread is. The left, that's south, that's where the light is. Here's your Bible belt. They got the doctrine straight, but they're not, but there's usually, most churches up north are as dead as a, uh, dead as a Yankee Stadium at 4 o'clock in the morning. Over here, they got the doctrine off, but people spit and bit, they get saved over here. Down south, they don't believe in nurseries. I can out preach any baby, amen. But they get, but they do have prayer rooms before the service. And 20, pre, 20 people in there all screaming at the same time out loud, all praying at the same time. You've never lived till you've been in a South Carolina, North Carolina prayer meeting. I've been in there. The guy I'm talking about now, the big preacher, you go in his room, they turn the lights out. I was in there with him. He's kneeling here in front of a wall, screaming at the wall in the dark. The wallpaper's peeling off. You know what that preacher said to me? He said, Brother Grady. He wasn't trying to be funny. He was trying to be sincere. He said, can I give you some Southern theology? He's looking around like hoping somebody didn't see him. He said, on Sunday morning, when the church is worshiping right, the right music, the right spirit, preaching, he said, that's the bride romancing the groom. I said, when that happens, babies get born at the altar. Mm. There's my goosebumps. I've been, tell yeah. I've, been yeah. telling, I've been telling that story for 20 years. I never get... Wow. That's holy stuff. Amen. Now, they're messed up down there a lot of times with doctrine. 
Bob Jones Sr. said he come into a church one time down south, South Carolina, some preacher was, uh, look at her looking for goosebumps. <laughs> I, just showed, I just showed your mind. I showed you, you better have goosebumps. That shows you're spiritual. <laughs> Bob Jones is, you know, he's, he walks in and some, you know, he's in the back looking up at the preacher at the pulpit, right? And the preacher's preaching on Luke 16 and he's got the rich man in, in, in heaven and Lazarus burning in hell. And, and Bob Jones starts doing this with two fingers, you know, like, trying to point and reverse it. And that preacher still thought he was egging him on. So he keeps on preaching, Lazarus burning like a, like a, you know, like a hot dog. You know, whatever. You know, and they give the invitation, like 20 people get saved. You know. That's down south. Oh, I'm telling you, neighbor. All right, so there's cross-referencing. See all that? Okay, now I got one more to do for the last few minutes because this, this is the most important one I can give you. And the preacher will have emphasized this with you forever. Let me show you the three most important verses in the Bible to make sense out of the Bible. Kabish, 2 Timothy, real quick. I'm going to talk about right division now for the last few minutes. 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2. This is the only verse in the Bible that commands a Christian to study. Did I, th did I say this morning there's a difference between studying the Bible and reading the Bible? Yeah, and started that tonight, first quote, remember? Um, this is also the only verse in the Bible that tells a Christian how to study the Bible. You think the devil was after that verse? Yep. Read this verse in every modern translation. It's all, everyone is twisted. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. See that? You have no idea how important that verse is. No idea. Every modern Bible says some crummy, present yourself, first of all, is what they say instead of study. Uh, correctly handling the word of truth rather than rightly dividing. By the way, isn't division a hate word today? Thank you very much. You only go, how many verses in the Bible before God divides the light from the darkness? And he's dividing all over the place. The first chapter of the Bible. That's a hate word. Let's all come together. Let's not divide. Yeah. Hey, Jesus broke that bread, divided it before he gave it out. Amen. Yeah. Okay, neighbor. All right, that's, that's the first verse. The Bible tells you the only way to make sense out of that Bible is to divide it correctly. Yes. Now, fundamentalists, Old Testament, New Testament. Again, I don't want to be ugly for the 45th time, but that, that, that's their division. Well, God gives you a, a second verse. I'm giving you three key verses. That's the first one. Let me give you the second one. 1 Corinthians 10.32. This is the verse that will tell you how to rightly divide the Bible. Okay. 1 Corinthians 10.32. Uh, brother, do me a favor. Read that for me. 1 Corinthians 10.32. Second key verse in sequence of three. Everything comes in threes. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Duh, there you go. There's your three divisions. Right there. See that Bible you got in your lap? All you got to do is this, look. You take that Bible and just, look. Any verse you put your finger on is addressed to one of those three groups and nobody else. Uh, Caleb Hickam thinks there's aliens in there too. There might be a fourth group. <laughs> right? Now, you know, listen. Oh, what did the crazy, the crazy lady that was too lazy to read her Bible, she's talking to the preacher. Remember you, everybody? Again, new Christians, again, preacher. Stuff I've heard for 46 years. You've got people who've been in this church a year, and the devil say, they know it. They've heard that. That's what's in my head all the time. They've heard that. They know that. They know. Here's a lazy Christian. Don't want to study the right way. She said, I'm going to find the will of God for my life. Ju Judas went out and hung himself. Hey, mercy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, forget about it. Look, and do it again. Go and do thou likewise. <laughs> you, get, you, get, you get in trouble studying like that. That's not the way to do it. Right. Hey, three times a charm. <laughs> what thou doest, do quickly. <laughs> oh, mercy. <laughs> Thank you. 
The old expression is, all of the Bible is written for you, but not all of the Bible was written to you. Can you remember that? If you Listen, do you know 90% of the saved people in this country do not understand what you just heard so far? That's why they're so easy to get thrown all over the place. Going to church on Saturday, how much time you got? There's no way... There's no way to get into all the crazy things that people are into because they don't know how to examine the passage and see who it's talking to. You're the church of God. You're not a, a Gentile. You're not a Jew. Kabish? And you'll learn that if you don't study anything else important with the pastor as he's discipling you. Make sure he drills that into you and you get to see how that works. All right. There's three, though. Turn to 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2. Good night, preacher. I'm 30 seconds into my five minutes, and I'm, I'm going to be done early. I'm impressed with myself. <laughs> All right, 2 Timothy 2. This is wild, neighbor. 2 Timothy 2. Okay. Um, well, <laughs> look how many times I've been teaching this passage. I ain't got no Bible anymore. Blah, blah, blah. Da, 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 da. Okay. Uh, uh, um, oh yeah, verse 7. Second Timothy 2, verse 7. These three verses go right in order. Look what verse 7 says. Consider what, what's the next word? Hi. Who's writing? Paul. Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding, and what's the next two words? Oh. All things. Now, here is the most important principle you'll ever learn, okay? All of, what 2 Timothy 3.16 say? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. When Paul was writing that, the New Testament really wasn't compiled and finished yet. That was mostly the Old Testament Scriptures he's talking about. That's When you're reading the New... The, people, the old expression is, don't read somebody else's mail. You're a church-age saint. Don't get hung up on some Old Testament kid. Can't cook on Saturday or you get executed. That's not for you. You're reading somebody else's mail. You, you can read that and get a principle out of it, but don't get hung up on it doctrinally. <clears throat> so what Paul just told you is this. When you get into the New Testament, there will be books in the New Testament that are extremely beneficial and helpful for any saved person. But sometimes their doctrinal teachings are not for a church age saint. You've got to be smart enough to be able to get the spiritual blessing out of those passages, but not get hooked on it if it's not the right doctrine for you. Right. How do you know? You do what that verse said. Yes. You read something over there, and you compare it to whatever Paul said about that subject. And if it goes together, you're okay. If it conflicts, you always go with Paul. You throw it out for a doctrinal application. Mm -hmm. He that endureth to the end shall be saved. Mm -hmm. that, that goes for Jesus. Throw out what he said. Mm -hmm. Rich young ruler. What do I do, Savior, uh, to inherit eternal life? You know, keep the commandments. Is that how you get to heaven in the church, eh? No. I have a, have a section in that book called, if you, believe in, if you do what Jesus said, you're going to go to hell sometime. Hmm. Ain't that a... You remember, remember the Godfather? Who saw the Godfather before you got saved? You remember at the end when the Godfather's uh, retired and the bit, Clemenza and the other dude, they, they want their own families? Come on, Godfather. You know, he says, trust me. Talk to Michael. He's taking care of everything now. That's Jesus passing it over to Paul. You better not listen to Jesus. He's the king of the Jews. He's dealing with Israel. You get all kind of stuff out of Jesus' life. Don't look at that. People falling out of the chairs. Don't listen to Jesus. <laughs> you understand what I mean? Yeah. He's dealing with the nation of Israel. Paul is his chosen spokesman. I think he called him on the Damascus Road to deal with you crazy Polacks and Germans and Italians, the Gentiles world, right? So, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, okay, so here's the thing. Most of the verses that can... Me okay, look here. I'm right on time. Look, here's the Old Testament. Here's the church age. Here's the tribulation period completing the church age. The, God is not done with that Jew yet, okay? He's got seven more years to deal with him over here. Kabish? 
Okay, so look at here. You got the four Gospels coming at the end of the Old Testament period going into the church age, right? You got the book of Acts starting the church age off, right? But look at here. When you get, then you got the Pauline epistles. I mean, in the church age, that's what it's for. The the, the church age, right after the church, after the Pauline epistles, you got these books from Hebrews to Revelation. What comes right after the church age? Tribulation period. Lots of the doctrinal stuff you read in those verses are going to tie in with tribulation saints, but that doesn't mean you would throw those books out the window, never read them, and never try to get something out of them. That's what a hyper dispensationalist called. But you're going to get stuff. Uh, 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 Hebrew, what would we just read there about uh, Hebrews 13, verse 13? 13. 13 words, you know, going outside the camp, bearing his reproach, you know, resisting that mark. Revelation 14, if you resist that mark, if you take that mark, you go to hell. What can you do in the church age to go to hell for? Nothing. You're sealed. Not in the tribulation period, you know. So people start getting mixed up. So if you read, the, 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 he, the deity of Christ is dealt with in Hebrews 1. Isn't, isn't Jesus God in the tribulation period like he's God in the church age? The doctrine of the deity of Christ in Hebrews is perfect. But when you get into something that clashes with Paul and is a contradiction, you go with Paul. Just like a New Testament, watch this one, just like a tribulation saint can get mixed up by the devil the same way. If you take the mark, you go to hell. Yeah, but Paul said, I'm eternally secure. Tribulation saints say, give me that mark. I'm okay because I got a Pauline epistle verse. That doesn't fit his world. That's backwards. Even our brother Paul, who said some things hard to be understood, which they that are, are ignorant and unlearned rest to their own destruction. I got eternal security. Paul said I do. Give me that mark. It's going to work for them. It's just like it's working for you. Know what you're reading. Kabish, Pastor, I am so wicked. I went two minutes into my past my five minute bonus. Thank you very much. Hallelujah, preacher. Don't mind me. I'm having a good time today.